Today we turn our attention to Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the causative agent of an important illness. So there was this mysterious outbreak in the late 1970s of rheumatoid arthritis near the community of Lyme, Connecticut. And this attracted the attention of Dr. Alan Steer. He found it odd that the onset of the illness had a seasonal occurrence with most cases occurring during the summer and early fall. The disease was also peculiar in that those who lived in or visited rural locations were disproportionately affected. He made the brilliant deduction that this is suggestive of an insect vector and hinted at an infectious disease. He named the disease Lyme disease after the town and the search began for the causative agent. After a long and arduous search, they realized it was a spirochete named Borrelia burgdorferi. Turns out Lyme disease has a wide distribution. It's in North America, it's in Europe, and in other places. It is the most common vector-borne disease in the United States, with about 40,000 confirmed cases per year in the U.S. The CDC estimates around 300,000 new cases are found each year. It is endemic to certain areas. And of course, Wisconsin is one of these endemic areas. The Atlantic Northeast is endemic. That's where you get lots of cases. And then the Wisconsin, Minnesota area. For Lyme disease to exist in these areas, three elements are necessary. The Lyme disease bacteria, the tick, and warm-blooded mammals for the tick to feed on. There is growing concern about this illness because its incidence has been increasing over the last two decades. It was about 12,000 back in 1995, and in 2015, the latest year that we have data for, it was about 38,000. So there is a significant increase in this illness. B. burgdorferi is a spirochete. Looking at the photomicrograph, you might think that it has a wavy morphology, but it's more like a corkscrew, and this shape is important in its pathology, as you'll see in a minute. Analysis of sequencing data from isolates has shown that the bacteria that cause this disease are phylogenetically and genotypically divergent. What this means is that it appears that there is not one species that causes this illness, but a collection of related bacteria that actually split into subspecies. The most important thing seems to be the ability to exist in a tick and a mammal and then have this corkscrew morphology. It has an unusual genome with one linear chromosome and 21 plasmids, nine of these being linear, so that's very different than what we've talked about in this course. B. burgdorferi is dependent upon its host and is an excellent scavenger of nutrients from it. Ticks from the genus Ixodes spread the disease. All are much smaller than common wood ticks as can be seen in the photograph. If you compare the size of the various developmental stages, larval, right here, nymph, and adult, you can see they're incredibly small. Look at, the, compare that to the head of the pin. Surveys of B. burgdorferi infection of ticks varies widely, having from as low as 3% in ticks in an area to be B. burgdorferi infecting up to 50% of the ticks in an area. A blood meal is required for the tick to advance from the larval to the nymph stage and then again from the nymphs to the adult stage. These blood meals can be taken from many different mammals, but the nymph usually feeds on small mammals such as mice at which time it becomes infected with Borrelia. Subsequent feedings on other mammals transmit the bacterium. Adult ticks preferentially feed on white-tailed deer, making them an important reservoir of the microbe. Eggs hatch into larvae that take their first meal in the summer from a small animal such as a mouse. They molt into nymphs and then go dormant until the next year. In the spring of the second year, nymphs take their second blood meal from small mammals, deer, dogs, birds, or humans, and molt into adults in the fall. A final blood meal is taken in the fall or early spring, and the adult then lays eggs. 
Infection begins with the bite of the tick for containing B. burgdorferi. In humans, the disease has three stages. In the first, which occurs seven to 14 days after the tick bite, a localized infection near the tick bite often results in a distinctive expanding rash, but not always. And in fact, this can get missed a lot of the times. As the rash develops, it may take on a bullseye appearance, and this is a clear indication of the illness. Fever, malaise, and flu-like symptoms may accompany the rash in a majority of patients. At this time, the microbe disseminates throughout the skin, blood, and lymph, and after about three to four weeks, the rash subsides. This dissemination is assisted by the corkscrew morphology of the organism. It can actually drill through your tissues and spread that way. The second stage involves a systemic infection and occurs days or weeks after the initial rash. Any of the following symptoms may occur as the spirochete spreads through the body. Multiple rashes at various sites, infection of the nervous system or heart, fatigue, chills, fever, headache, muscle and joint pain, swollen lymph nodes, and secondary skin lesions. In the third stage, more serious and unusual symptoms occur as the microorganism penetrates deeper into tissues. Lyme arthritis, a painful inflammation of the joints, is common in the larger joints, but the pain and swelling are transitory, unlike other types of arthritis. Rarely, Lyme arthritis can lead to erosion of cartilage and or bone. Infections of nerves in the spinal cord occur and can result in many different symptoms, including paralysis and other neurological complications. Heart damage may be involved as well. The mechanisms of pathogenesis of B. burgdorferi basically have to do with its growth. It doesn't have any classic things that we would call toxins. It's just the growth and spread and then your body's immune reaction to it, it, your immune system's reaction, that causes the damage. Virulence determinants do vary between strains. Things that they have is, first of all, all of them have this unique mobility that allows them to drill into tissues. This is different than a lot of pathogens that have to kind of depend upon the circulatory system or the lymph system or macrophages to spread. Adhesins will bind to the sides of blood vessels and then the microbe will wiggle through and invade tissues. Then they degrade the host extracellular matrix and then to avoid the immune system, they will vary their antigens that you see on the outside. It is difficult to diagnose Lyme disease simply from the presentation of symptoms. The early stages are confused with the flu or other viral infections. Late complaints of joint pain can be mistaken for other types of arthritis. Neurological signs can be misconstrued as multiple sclerosis. And I know of examples of individuals who were diagnosed with MS that once they did a Lyme test, they realized, no, they had Lyme disease. You must check for the presence of the antibodies against Borrelia. And there is a good test that will test for your body's immune response to this. And if you're positive, it means you're exposed to Lyme disease. Clinical isolation of this organism is rarely done due to the difficulty of culturing the organisms. Fortunately, there is a reasonably good treatment for Lyme disease. Doxycycline, which is a semi-synthetic derivative of tetracycline, is the preferred treatment for Lyme disease. The drug is hydrophobic and can penetrate deep into tissues, eliminating the pathogen. Normally, with one or two rounds of treatment, infection can be cured. A component vaccine against Lyme disease consisting of the OSPA protein from B. burgdorferi has been developed and found protective when given in three doses in an intramuscular injection. Because the vaccine does not protect against other tick-borne illnesses, it did not gain wide acceptance. Indeed, the manufacturer discontinued the production of the vaccine, presumably due to poor sales. Because of the increase in cases and the serious consequences of infection, there is a renewed interest in making a vaccine. Hopefully in the next few years, we'll have one. 
So here's your question. Imagine you are at the CDC. Brainstorm ways to decrease the incidence of serious cases of Lyme disease. There's a number of things that you can come up with and none of them is really right or wrong. So what I would think is number one, actually get the vaccine out there so that people who spend a lot of time outdoors in areas where there is this organism, you can get vaccinated against it. Another thing is education. Educate physicians, educate people in endemic areas about the symptoms of Lyme disease and as something to look out for. Because if you treat this early, you can eliminate it before it causes too much damage. All right, that is it for Lyme disease.